let's jump right into our first session tonight. And our first session is something that we call the kingdom parable. And I won't take long to introduce it because part of the way that parables work is they sneak up on you. And so what we want to do is in with this parable, the only thing I want to say to introduce it is this is the least teaching thing that we do in this, in this setting. What we try to do is provide, if you think of a painting, we try to provide a backdrop on which the next four sessions, we're gonna paint on the front of that backdrop. So this is a story that will give most of the concepts that you're about to hear in the four classes that follow, but this story we call the Kingdom Parable. I like to call it the Parable of the Acrobat. And here's how you start a parable, because that's how Jesus did it. The Kingdom of Heaven is like an acrobat who fell off the wagon. Here's how the Kingdom of Heaven is like that. Once upon a time, a long time ago, and I haven't quite figured out how long ago that is, but a long time ago, there's a troop of acrobats. These acrobats traveled across the countryside and they were known for the entire scope. In fact, outside of where they traveled, they were, they were known by, just simply by, by reputation as an amazing group of athletes who it seemed, not only could they do things that seemed superhuman, but it almost seemed as if they were in charge of gravity rather than gravity being in charge of them. They were just that good. They were strong, they were flexible, they were quick, and they had generations of of training and capability that allowed them to do things that you and I would sit back and go, holy mackerel, how did they do that? And so when they would come to town, people would line up and they would come to the tent on the far side of town to watch this show and their jaws would just drop. Well, here's the thing you need to know about this troop of acrobats. In this troop of acrobats, there's a man and a woman. The greatest male acrobat ever known to their entire troop, both historically and present day, and the greatest female lived at the same time. And as my story would go, they fell in love, got married, and conceived a child. Now think about this for a moment, if you would. The two greatest acrobats ever known to the greatest troop of acrobats ever conceive a child. Even the two of them in their quiet moments alone, much less the whole troop of acrobats, would sometimes think to themselves, what will this child be capable of? They begin to envision things that even in their own minds, they knew that this child would be capable of pushing the limits of what they had known themselves both physically and in terms of just sheer creativity and ability to do things with gravity under him instead of over him, the imagination of them, the parents, and the troop of what could happen just began to consume the whole group. Well, it was their anticipation and excitement that made the tragedy all the more difficult. See, the tragedy was that one night, as they're traveling from one area to another, somewhere in the middle of the night, After this child was born, somewhere in the middle of the night, this child fell out of the wagon. Now, they didn't discover this until hours later. In fact, they don't know how many hours because what happened is the mother woke up in the morning and she reached for the spot in the back of the wagon where the child should have been sleeping and all she found was a blanket. And as she began to realize that the child was actually gone, of course, her heart just sinks and she screams at the top of her lungs, he's gone. And so she gets the whole wagon train to stop and people come to gather around and she says, I, I can't find him. And of course, everyone's in different states of mind. She, she's been searching for a while, so her heart's just been sinking. And yet others are still beginning to make plans and strategies for how we're going to find him. And someone starts to organize them and they start to spread out over the area and hours begin to pass. Time goes by and as the mother's heart sinks and the dread begins to set in and the whole troop, the disappointment of losing this child who's been their hope, the the emotion begins to take over the entire group and fear and dread, anxiety, all these things begin to consume them and no matter how long, no how far, how wide they search, they can't find them anywhere. Fortunately, though they had no way of knowing, somewhere back along the trail, not too far behind them that night, a farmer and his wife had been following along behind. And though they were far enough behind that they could, didn't know the wagon train was up there, they were, they were just close enough that they found 
a small bundle in the, in the bushes alongside the road. They, they heard a sound, they pulled over, and they looked, and sure enough, here's a baby, and because this is a Bible-ish story, it's wrapped in swaddling clothes, right? <laughs> they pick the child up, and you know how inexperienced parents will do. They hold the child kind of looking. Well, here's what's happening. Well, miles ahead, the wagon train of acrobats is still going on yet to discover the loss of this child. They're looking, and they're immediately responding to their own reality. See, the farmer and his wife had lived together for years in, the, in a neighboring farm. And though they had tried a number of different times, they'd not been able to conceive a child. There came a point, in fact, where they both just resigned themselves to this existence together with no children. He worked the farm, she took care of the home, and they both grew kind of hard in their own way. The farmer is a man who worked the dirt, just kind of developed a sense of this is what I'm here for, I just do this, and as long as I take care of this, then I, everything's good. And the wife did her part, and their, their home had just become rather a cold place. He just in his hardness grew kind of just angry at times, and she in her hardness was just fearful and anxious. And so what happens is, after a while of looking around themselves, they realize they can't find who this child might belong to, and it dawns on them, they're responsible. They take this baby back to their home and they set up a room as best as they understand how as people who've never raised a child. And, and the mother, of course, is trying with, you know, just trembling that she has this new responsibility. And the father, of course, is kind of like, great. And this is the atmosphere that the child comes into. Now, let me ask you a question. At the point that the baby acrobat fell from the wagon, was he still an acrobat? Well, before you answer, let me teach you how to answer. Do this. Okay. This will be the answer to every single question I ask you. And if I change that, I'll let you know. Why, why was it that the baby acrobat, even though he fell off the wagon and left his family behind, why was it that he's still an acrobat at that point? Because his DNA and his birthright determine who he is, not the trauma of his birth circumstances. Right? Well, let me ask you another question then. The farmer and his wife, they pick him up, they take him home. They've become his new parents. At the point that she lays him down in, in the crib for the first time in their house, is that baby still an acrobat? Remember? Okay. Why? Because his DNA and his birthright determine who he is, not the family that he's raised in. Are we good? All right, let's roll on. So the child grows, as children are prone to do. And the baby turns into toddler. Now, you have to keep in mind, because he is, do this, he is still an acrobat. A two-year-old acrobat is different than a two-year-old farmer. And what that means is that as he begins to get up off the ground, he doesn't just get up off the ground. He starts looking to the heights. You know, in the farmer's house, there are curtains and old wooden tables countertops. And so the first time he drags himself up on his feet, he's not just satisfied with walking. He's looking around the room going, how far off the ground can I get? Because remember, he's designed to have gravity under him, not over him. And everything about him, every bit of his energy is directed towards trying to fulfill what's true about him as an acrobat. So when he looks up, when he looks at these things, his heart just burns inside of him. Well, what do you think this does for the farmer's wife's fear? <gasps> Get down off of there! She's filled with anxiety, and every time she catches him climbing and, and swinging on the curtains, I'm looking around to see if anyone else would approve of that anyway. Anytime she catches him defying gravity, it raises her own fear level to a point where she begins to just anything she can to stop him from being himself. And he, at age two, immediately becomes aware that if he is himself, his mother may pay a price for that. Now, the other thing is, on top of her fear, the father, protective of his wife as he is, looks and says, every time she's fearful, I'm going to come in and I'm going to do something about this. And so, 
where her fear takes over, his anger comes in to try to get her fear under control, and this child is trapped in between their emotions. And at age two, he's already keenly aware that his whole environment is set against who he really is. Let me ask you a question. As that awareness dawns on him that his entire environment is set against him, fulfilling his identity, is he still an acrobat? Good. And the reason for that is because his DNA and his birthright determines who he is, not the forces set against him. So he continues to grow. And as he grows, what happens is his capability of climbing and jumping and swinging also grows with him. But his wisdom about the times to do it and the times not to also grows with him. So when he's convinced that mom is gone, he's going to try again to get off the ground and get gravity under him and him over it. At a particular time when mom comes in and here he is, he's perched on the top of a countertop, stre stretching to get just a little bit higher. And when she walks in, she just, the blood drains from her face and she snatches him off the counter. Her husband comes in right behind, behind her and there's just this horrible moment where both of their emotions are at a crescendo and this child's just terrified and something happens inside of his little heart in that moment. He says to himself inside of his heart, I will never allow myself to try to be that person again. Very important that we hear this next question. At that moment when his heart turns, is he still an acrobat? We must hear this, that his DNA and his birthright determines who he is, not the turnings of his heart and the leanings of his soul. Age 10 comes around, and the father, the farmer who's been raising him all these years, looks at him and says, it's time to take you out in the field, boy. Well, he's just finally got the house under control where he can keep his heart at, at bay, and he's no longer tempted to swing on curtains, though it has been very costly to him to give up on his dreams. He steps outside with his father, the farmer, and he's, he's, there's trees everywhere, and there's, there's hills and rocks all around, and then there's the the barn with the rope on it that he, he sees these things and all he can think of is his heart leaps inside of him again this feeling that he used to have every day in fact this feeling that's really who he is leaps up inside of him and as soon as he does the farmer says get your eyes on the ground we've got work to do it doesn't take long before he discovers that if he can work hard and really break up the ground and really prepare the ground for the seed that this man is actually quite proud of him when he performs his work. And so he discovers that not only can he avoid the pain by not being himself, but he can gain approval by being someone else's version of himself. Years go by, and one day he's out there working, and he just glances up for a moment, and what he sees when he glances up is a big, tall tree the wind is blowing the branches and, and he feels that thing in his heart for a second and as he looks, his leg falls in a hole in the ground and, and as the plow pulls him forward, he twists his ankle. And just then the farmer looks over at him and sees that he's in an awkward position. What's going on, boy? And he gets up and tries the best as he can to pretend he's okay, but he's actually done serious damage to his ankle. And so he's just trying to go about the work that he's got to do and pretend he's not wounded. As time goes on, see, there's other kids in this farming community, and these other kids, as they get to know him, what they discover is he seems to be, them to be kind of an odd kid. And they don't quite know how to interact with this person who himself knows that he's not really where he belongs, whether he knows that or just senses that. And so what happens is, remember, he's a supercharged athlete. He's got within him the power the strength, the flexibility, the drive, more importantly, the identity to put gravity under his dominion. But he's lived his entire life underneath its control. And so what happens is this thing about him that's made to take dominion over gravity, the best he can do with it is take dominion over other boys in the neighborhood. And out of his frustration and out of his inability to do what he was designed for, he begins to develop a reputation as kind of an angry, violent young man. 
And so rather than harm or hurt other people, he withdraws and finds himself just all by himself wondering how his life has become this. Not really knowing at this point what his life was supposed to become, he just found himself wondering, how did I end up here? Just like every life-changing circumstance, the next thing that happened also snuck up on him. See, one day, as is so often the case, he's going through his normal routine, and when his parents often send him down to the local feed store, he goes down and he fills up with what he's been assigned to pick up, he pays with their money, and he carts it back home, limping back home because of his bad leg. And he's, but he's down at the feed store one day, and as he's looking across for the things that they need, suddenly his eyes fall on something that's not been there before. See, behind the counter there in the store is a poster. And on that poster is a trapeze. And on that trapeze is a man with his hands hanging on to it. And he can see by the, the image here that this man is flying through the air, hanging on to this thing hundreds of feet off the ground. And something leaps up inside of him. The acrobats are coming back to town. He doesn't know anything except what he feels. And this fire that just explodes inside of his chest sends him back home to begin what I like to call the campaign. The campaign is what most of you as parents will recognize as what happens when your child wants something and you're not sure. But he wins the campaign and finally gets his parents to agree. If you can have the farm all taken care of, if you can have all the chores done, we'll take you down to the tent at the side of town and we'll go with you to this show that you've just been begging and pleading that you want to see. And so a week goes by and he's working twice as hard and he's doing everything he can to have the farm ready. And so in that moment, the day, the, the day before the acrobats are there, he can barely sleep. He's laying in his bed just feeling that thing that he felt at the store that day. And he finally drifts off to sleep. And here's, here's the thing. That night, he has a dream. And in that dream, he sees the same thing he saw on the poster. Trapeze flying through the air. High wire. Flaming ball of death whatever that might be. But in his dream, he's not watching someone else. It's his hands on the trapeze. And it's his body that's hurtling through the air. And he's the one feeling gravity under him instead of over him. And this just set, he wakes up just a flame. He gets everything ready and gets himself dressed and still like three hours before the show. And you know, he's just, come on, we, can we go early? Finally, the time comes and they head down to the tent on the far side of town. And what happens, he sits down there, but he doesn't really sit. He, he's like right on the edge watching what's going on here. And as he watches, the show begins. And this fire that's inside him just becomes an explosion that never stops through the entire show. Finally, the end of the show comes and he's, he's out of his chair and he's down on the floor. And he's meeting the men and the women and he's touching the trapeze and the high wire and the flaming ball of death whatever that is, and, and he's interacting with all these things, and his, his father and mother are standing back. Of course, the mom's trying not to stand back. She's wanting to stop, and the father's just kind of, you know, holding her back and just let him, let him go. 